You are tuning in to the human side of engineering and product development podcast, brought to you by Sarah Tech, where we bring you industry leaders and some of the brightest minds in engineering solutions and product development. I'm Andy Deal, your host. Join me as we discover the inspiring stories of the people behind the most innovative and game-changing solutions in the market today. So tune in and enjoy. Good morning. Welcome to our podcast. I have with me today, Jed Bullwinkle. Jed is the Director of Design Solutions at Ceratech. Jed, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Doing well, doing well. Thanks for having me. Now, thank you for being on the podcast today. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what you do at Ceratech as a Design Solutions Director? Yeah, so um, you know, I manage the uh, both the design and the analysis COEs or centers okay. of excellence. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, I'm, my background is definitely a lot more on the design side. So, uh, mechanical design, aerospace design in particular. Um, so, you know, it's anything that has to do with uh, CAD, uh, mechanical CAD design, or um, in this case, right now, also analysis that they kind of complement each other. So, okay, and, um, and your team yeah. work actually works on customer projects and deliverables, right? It's not just a bunch of demo jocks out there. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. That is a good point. So um, it's more, you know, we're very services. So um, any kind of work offload projects that's going to come in from, um, from a customer where they need some kind of, um, some kind of solution around, a, a, you know, mechanical design, CAD design, um, again, maybe supported by stress analysis, but um yeah. So if we, uh, again, by offload, I mean, you know, the project itself would be handed off to my organization uh -huh. and we, we run the, the whole, um, uh, well, it really, as far as, as much as we can in terms of, uh, the requirements. So. I see. I see. So one of the things that I have to bring up, I love your last name because growing <laughs> up, watching reruns of Rocky and Bullwinkle. That was one of my favorite cartoons ever. Um, for for, I like it too. for yeah. some of our younger audiences, maybe they have no idea who Rocky and Bullwinkle is. But it was it was a cartoon uh, started in the late 50s into the early 60s, the original series anyways. And it, it was a cartoon about this flying squirrel with his buddy, um, you know, Bullwinkle, the, the bull, and, and they go and get into all kind of hilarious situation and, and things like that. But that show was, was really about, um, you know, commentary on the Cold War. There's a lot of educational and adult humors in that show, actually, when, when you go back and take a look at it. It's not just for kids. And so when I saw... Um, when you came on board with Sarah Tech, I said, Jen Bullwinkle, that's really cool because I, I love that show. Do you do you have um, any idea of the origin of your last name? Because it's not a common it last is. name. There's not a lot of Bullwinkles out there. No. Well, okay, so what's kind of funny about that is, you know, I, I went through my whole, most of my life until just about a few years ago um, before I actually really, my, my father's fairly quiet about that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. and, well, he was adopted. And so really, I actually have no blood relation to that name. Is that it's, right? Um, oh, wow. was, yeah, it was his adoptive father. Um, so I mean, I've been learning German for about the last three years or so, <laughs> three and a half years. So I, you know, I, it, I think it basically means like a bull worker. So somebody that would work with bulls. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but my actual real well, not real, but, you know, what my last name would have been, and you know, my blood would have been good or gut in German. Oh, I see. So it, it's still German, but, um, but yeah, I, I actually don't have a, a, uh, any connection to that. But uh, to your point, I actually really enjoyed those cartoons. They kind of predated me a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, for sure. Know, just, just a little bit, like about, a, yeah, I don't know, five, ten years. <laughs> but, um, but you're right. It's, yeah, they're actually really uh, – Good series. Anybody that hasn't seen those, go, go dig them up. I don't know where to find them, but yeah, you, you can probably find them on the internet somewhere. You know, if, if you if you're searching from. And I remember there was a movie that came out, and 
in 2000, there an actual was. movie, and Robert De Niro was in yep. that movie. So yep. imagine that, Robert De Niro. I mean, it wasn't a great movie or anything, but still, Robert De Niro no, doing no. a Rock and Bull Winkle movie. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Anymore, they'll probably just remake it, I'm sure. <laughs> That's probably coming in the next few years. Yeah. yeah, we'll see. So when did you grow up? Uh, so Northern California. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I was actually born in the Sierra Mountains, uh, Sierra Nevada Mountains, and uh, um, ended up in the Bay Area, the San Jose Bay Area. Um, and then uh, I don't know, about 20, a little over 20 years ago, um, ended up having a job change or, uh, you know, um, got picked up by Boeing in uh -huh. uh, Southern California. So. Um, so that brought myself and my family. We moved down there and we, we've been there ever since until just uh, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. And now here we are out in middle Tennessee. Yeah. What, what's it like out there in Tennessee? I, I'm sure it's, it's a very different vibe than, than Southern California or California in general, right? It is. But what's kind of interesting is, you know, we, we were honestly, we were expecting to come out and see a lot of pickup trucks and, you know, <laughs> Like everything's country music and all that. Yeah. It's not like that. And it, there's probably every fifth car you see has a California license plate on it. And, um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of transplants. I didn't expect to see that, but anyway, it is absolutely beautiful out here. Everything is very green. Um, it is a slower pace of life kind of for the most part, but, um, but, uh, kind of helps yeah, that there's no state tax out there either. Right. It's one of the reasons. <laughs> it's one of the benefits. So that's nice. Yeah, yeah I, I've yeah. always wanted to go visit Tennessee. You know, obviously Nashville, world famous, yeah. but I'm, I'm sure Nashville is nothing like the rest of Tennessee. You know, just like when you go to when you go to Nevada and you go to Vegas, it's nothing yep. like the rest of. The, uh, the that's rest accurate. Of that's very accurate. It's uh, it's still worth a visit. You know, but oh, if, for sure, you know, for sure, and. And specifically, so we're in Williamson County, which is just south of, of Nashville. And, you know, we had to also learn, well, you know, what's around here and that yeah. kind of thing, see and do all that. And um, a lot of history. I mean, you know, a lot of Civil War battles came straight yeah. through here. So and, what's your favorite uh, so, food out there? I mean, it's tough to beat barbecue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, Come on now. Come on now. It, you're you're it, in the it, heart of barbecue country, you know. Yeah, right in the heart of it. It's <laughs> and, and it's honestly, um, uh, it it's it is what they say. <laughs> it's, good. it's good. I do miss some of the variety um, in in Southern California. There's a lot of food variety in Southern California. Oh yeah, it's, yeah, it's excellent. But but uh, yeah, yeah, barbecue. Yeah. You, you definitely can't beat that area for sure. Yeah, for yep. sure. Uh, so now. Growing up, I always ask this question of, of, of my guests. Did you choose engineering or did engineering choose you? Um, so I would say mechanical design, I probably chose that, but design engineering, I think, chose me in, in a sense. Um, and then transitioned over a little bit to um, what's called a project engineering or mm technical program management and then, you know, eventually engineering management. But, um, but yeah, it started out. I just, it, I remember somebody told me a long time ago that, um, it, you know, if you're fascinated or interested in the mechanics of, of things like planes, trains, and automobiles, yeah. and they said specifically those three things, um, you know, mechanical engineering or mechanical design. I mean, that's probably in, you know, it's, it's probably, uh, in your wheelhouse, so yeah. to speak, it's probably something that's going to be very interesting to you. So, um, yeah, so I started out, you know, doing, uh, just taking some, some CAD drafting courses, you know, in high school mm -hmm. and moving into college, going into some, you know, um, more into that kind of always leaning that direction and, and then, you know, into mechanical engineering and, and eventually, um, you know, uh, it was interesting though. My my first job at Laurel, I actually started out more uh, more doing the technician stuff mm. because that's where the need was. Right. So I came in through that way, and um, so I actually have spent a lot of time doing the um, at least in the very beginning of my career doing a lot of the hands on. Oh, which I, see. I think was yeah. really beneficial. Yeah. Now, 
we we are in the middle of engineering shortage, right? In terms of resources, um, yeah. you know, obviously with with a lot of uh, the the people from the baby boomer generation retiring, even Gen uh, Gen X now. I'm a Gen X myself. You know, are, are getting up to that age mm -hmm. where it's it's we're getting close to retirement. So we absolutely need more engineers. Uh, and, you know, there, there are programs out there like STEM or STEAM that hopefully helps encourage uh, young people to get more involved and, and um, you know, focus their, their future career on technology and engineering. How do you think we can attract more young people to the engineering field in general? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging because, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, feel almost um you know uh, they they're almost gravitated or pulled to to towards engineering in general and i think what a lot of people as students maybe or if you're if you're considering it a lot of people don't realize there are a lot of facets to the engineering world just because you know you go become a mechanical engineer or, or whatever it you can specialize in a lot of different things mm -hmm. and a lot of different um sides of that and you know um, I think just showing that is sometimes really beneficial to be able to see, you know, there's, um, if, if you're interested in, um, the, the, the math part of it, maybe uh -huh. you're heavy on math that maybe you want to go be a stress analyst at some point, maybe right. that's really appealing to you. Um, I, I found between design and analysis, um, of all, I've interviewed a lot of people in my career. Yeah. And a lot of new grads, a lot of interns, and typically it, it's like um, almost like 80-20, you know, so 80% would be um, on the design side, interested in the design side, yeah. and 20% in the, like the analysis side. But it's very clear. There's no hesitation there. It's, 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 they know pretty immediately what, you know, when I talk to them, right. it, it doesn't take long, um, most of them. But, um, but yeah, I think just highlighting that there are these different sides to this, you know, um, and the other thing is I would say for, especially for design engineering, um, it's creativity. You, you have to, right. um, you know, you, it's not just this mechanism that you have to go figure out, um, okay, well, this, this plugs into here, you know, there's already this predefined solution, um, there's there's a, I don't know five different ways sometimes to right. solve a design problem maybe ten different ways and and which one is the best which one is the most optimal for you know to meet the requirements to meet the um, uh, cost schedule quality those are the you know your your uh, three uh, primary components there of, of yeah. any project so yeah and and that's that's the the part that I think a lot of people may miss and. Because most people think, hey, engineering, it's highly technical. It's so structured. You can't be creative because everything is part of a system. You have to do things a certain way. But being an engineer, you do need a lot of creativity, don't you? Because you, you, in essence, you're a problem solver. So you need to find different approaches or different ways to solve a specific problem. And you have these constraints, you know, obviously, if you have unlimited budget, yes, you, you can do anything you want. But in real life, there there are a lot of constraints when it comes to materials, when it comes to safety, when it comes to budget. So you have to be very creative to make all of those things work together um, right. to, to deliver what you need to deliver as a part, right? Yep. Yeah, and that's right. And that's that's one of the you know key differences. Um, uh, you know, I remember on... Um, uh, JSF, so F-35, yeah. Joint Strike Fighter. Um, so I did some some components on that. Uh, and, you know, there was, um, in fact, one of my engineers uh, also did, uh, worked on that. We, both of us um, went back in the day when that was being yeah. uh, developed. I remember that program. It, when it yep, was yeah, and, and that's a fantastic um, aircraft. And it, it, it's light, it's quick, um, you know. Yeah. Uh, short takeoff, vertical landing. That's the Stovall, you know, and yeah. it seems yeah. all conventional takeoff landing. But so the, where the, on the CTOL variant, there's a Gatling gun. Okay. On, yeah. Um, port side, port side. Um, 
So left. I That's guess, left here. for those uh, uninitiated. <laughs> yes, how how yeah, I remember yeah. that is, is I say port has four letters, so it's left. So that's our yep, <laughs> which that's, one is left. <laughs> that's the way I remember it. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, but underneath the Gatling gun, um, there's there's the the battery of you know not like electrical battery, but the battery of, of ammunition, the the magazine, right, I guess, right. and, and the firing components. And so there's a trough underneath that. And then the forward part of that, um, there's another trough, but that's underneath the barrels. Well, it fires depleted uranium very quickly and it heats up really fast. So, I mean, the barrels turn white hot and they, there's an issue with, um, at the time, I'm, obviously they solved it, but there's a little door that has to open up for stealth, you know, and yeah, it yeah. floods a bunch of air in there. So. So you have um, the heat from the barrels, you have the, just the noise, the acoustics, um, that adds a, a load, a certain amount of pressure. Yeah. Um, there's, if you're banking maybe, you know, if it's really hot out already, um, and you know, you just, uh, there's all these things that kind of conspire together. So I was modeling the aft trough and Larry was actually doing the forward and he was helping to do a forward. So the back one had to be, aluminum the forward one had to be titanium oh wow so um as you can imagine just simply procuring titanium takes you know months oh, to yeah. get something that big it's oh, as yeah. big as a, an office desk you know or a table that's why those things cost so, so much money <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's it's really expensive and you don't get to just you know i mean this has to be production you don't right. just make one, one jsf you have to make many of these and so they had to figure out, they, they kept getting this buckling, you know, so, so back and forth with the dynamicist and a you know, stress analyst and, and design. And so Larry's, you know, was working on, okay, put gussets here. Okay. Well, thicken this one, thin this out, you know, put holes here. And so, I mean, that was, so I got the easy one in a sense, cause I got to do the, the aluminum one. Right. And, you know, so, um, and, and that was, so I, was like, I thought it was a good example of, you know, if you're, design it's it's not just cut and dry you have to go you have to work with your and yeah. um, your stress analyst and in this case even the dynamicist to figure out okay what what's going to work what why does this work why doesn't it work what can we do and you really have to think outside the box right and and in one of my previous conversations with another guest on this podcast uh we talked about a lot of time as a designer you have to really think about how what you're doing affects the people down the line, right? Because it's it's not just you doing this thing in a bubble. There's a process, there's collaboration that's involved. And really what you do affects people in other departments that you can make the job easier or the job extremely difficult, right? So yes. there's, there's a whole lot of collaboration. And, and I think that's part of the the challenge and the fun uh, of, of being in product development, right? Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, that's a really good topic. Um, it's a DFM a, so design for manufacturing and assembly. Uh -huh. And, um, I think where, um, where I probably got the most, um, fundamental knowledge of that, or where I really got the most experience in, in that was, um, uh, working at my previous job, Rockwell Collins. Um, so I had to spend a lot of time going down to, they're going out to the shop floor. And then also when that the product got transitioned to Mexicali, I would go down to Mexicali a lot for yeah. a number of years. And that's where you really see. So the designs that, that had been worked out, uh, and supposedly perfect designs, you know, that right, passed right. the requirements and everything was good when you start seeing how it is in production and you start getting returns and you know, that are, that don't meet the MTBF, MTBR, mean time between failure, mean time between unscheduled removals, yeah. stuff like that. And then that's when you can really dig into, okay, how is this, um, how is this being assembled? And, you know, um, is it prone to failure? Is it prone to, um, do you, do you increase the risk? of having quality issues just in the way it's assembled or the way, you know, right. And, and then, and actually going back to, sorry, going back to JSF, um, 
uh, you know, we, we are also, we were also working with the manufacturing engineers because we would design something and they would using an, a, a CAD tool in Katia actually, but, um, taking this tool uh-huh. and sliding this in and figuring out how to orient this tool to get it into here. And then the mechanics hand, right. So they, right. So they created graphical representations of that. In some cases you couldn't do it. You just simply couldn't get in here to, to actually torque down a, a bolt or something or yeah. to, you know, a rivet. You just couldn't do it. So we had to make spe- special, you know, changes, I guess. And, open up certain areas and thicken up other areas and all that. He had to do a lot just so that you could install it and you could actually, and the other one is inspection. Yeah. Being able to actually, a lot of people overlook the inspection part, but it's, it's critical. I mean, when you get to, you, you know, CMM um, inspections. So where you're, you're very um, precisely measuring components. Right. Can you do it once you've uh, assembled it or, or once you've made it, can you make this you, in CAD? You can design something such that you're, you can't actually measure it. You can't get a tool in to accurately measure it, to make sure that it's happened. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, so there's obviously it's a very complex process and there's a lot of great tools out there. Uh, one of the things, one you mentioned was Katia, there's NX, all of these tools. Um, I think at this point, they all can do the job, right? It, it really depends on preference and maybe um, an organization, you know, is used to doing things with a certain set of tools. But I, I think the tool shouldn't matter that much today or should it? Well, it, it should. It still should. And, and to your point, it's almost like a... a uh, multiple paths that are slowly converging. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when I first started my career, I always say I, I cut my teeth on, <laughs> on PTC, uh, pro engineer. Right. And, um, and now, which is now Creo in its latest iteration. Right. And I think there's a tendency when you really get to know that product, that sure. item, sure. To say that this is the best. Right. And, you know, because maybe you, if you don't have experience in something else or whatever it is, and you just kind of get myopic and you say, well, this is the best product. Yeah. You know? And you have your personal bias, and right? Yeah. You, you do. You, yeah. You develop that. And, and that's okay because it's something you know. Um, and then uh, and then I learned uh, Katia, I think was next. And then Katia became my new favorite. Right. I said, well, okay. <laughs> it's. Is not as good on the drafting side, but boy, is it good on the, the the surfacing side and the, you know, it's free form, lets you get away with stuff, you know, and you can come back to it later and whatever. And then NX. So then I get into NX and back in NX four. So pretty early on. Yeah. Um, and it still had a lot of growing pains. There's a lot of things that it, it, you know, it needed to improve. And what happened was along the, the way, um, NX grew exponentially like they yeah they really focused and i don't know if that's the siemens uh you know input there or intervention right, right. or whatever it is but but really they they did a great job of just developing that and they got they they listened i think to the the issues um that people were having the designers were having yeah. and and they solved them and and you know again <laughs> not trying to have this to implement this bias i've used um, I mean, used uh, SolidWorks, Ideas, yeah. Pro Engineer, um, Katia, and NX. I would say NX is now the one to beat. I think they have definitely set the bar. And again, not trying to sound like an advertisement for Siemens <laughs> NX, but it, it, you know, this it, after using all of the others, I think there each has it, its advantages and disadvantages. Sure, to sure. be completely frank about it. And I think most, uh, if I have this right, I think most uh, aircraft, uh, typically aircraft companies, manufacturers, OEMs, tend to use um, Katia. They've migrated to Katia, and I, there are a couple I think that are starting to migrate away from Katia mm-hmm. because Katia V5 is almost like 
Windows XP was, you know, right. it, it, it just lasted way longer than its shelf life because right. it, it was overall a good product that they got used to. But now it's kind of getting dated and NX has eclipsed it. Right. And, and I know there's Katia V6 out, but again, I think NX is still leading the way. And then if you're in the spacecraft world, it's probably going to be Creo or, you know, what was pro engineer PTC right. product. Right. But, um, I think, uh, automotive, I think is NX. So, I mean, it's, they, they choose it because there are sure. different strengths and weaknesses, you know, but I'd say generally overall, um, I think NX is probably the, they've set the bar at this point. Yeah. I mean, Siemens obviously has invested a lot of dollars into development and creation, right? So, a lot. um, I mean, um, like I said, not, not to be a, a advertisement for Siemens, but you know, y you guys, your department are in the heart of it. You use the tool every day. You, you know, you, you actually do production work with it. And so you, you know, right. Um, now going back to being a young engineer. So if, if you, if, if I were a young engineering student going to school, want to study in engineering, what skills should I focus on developing as, as a student wanting to become an engineer. Yeah. And, and I would say if you're, uh, th this is where I go circle back to that focus, you know, that, okay, now we know there are a lot of different facets to engineering. Um, that's where you can kind of fine tune that if, if you're, um, if you want to be on the analysis side, certainly, yeah, definitely pay attention in your, your, uh, um, your courses, you, you know, um, uh, trig and whatnot. But um, design, it, it's going to be heavy on geometry and it's going to be heavy on um, understanding but, you know, materials, sciences, things like that. You, you probably want to have a good grasp of, of that. Like what's, what's going to be the right, um, you know, material or metal to use? Uh, do we you know, focus on machine versus casting versus, okay, what about 3D printing? What about added manufacturing? You right. know? So I think that would be really good to understand. But, and, and also if you want to find a, if, if design is more in, of interest to you, think about that creativity, think about that working outside the box. You know, um, a lot of times when I, um, when I interview uh, new grads or, or interns, um, I usually like to just find one project, one part that they've done. Uh -huh. And they say that, oh, I did the, X, Y, Z on this part. Oh, okay. So let's walk through that. And so you did the actual, you know, design of this. How did you know how to size the hole? How did you know how to, how did you know that this was going to work? And I would say a lot of times what I get is in response is trial and error. Mm. I, I tried this thing and it didn't quite fit or it didn't, right. or it broke or something happens. And so then I'll always come back and I bring up the example of, the titanium for right. trough on JSF and I'm like, or, or our own project on, you know, Sierra, Sierra Nevada doing the dream chaser, same thing, big panels of titanium, big billets of titanium that take months to procure and they're very expensive. You don't get a second chance. Right. That has to be right from day one. Right. So, so it's usually a deer in the headlights kind of like, Oh wow. So I think just understanding that future state, um, like you said, that DFMA understanding, holistically what that that process looks like and being able to you know think i guess think a little bit beyond just what's directly in front of right you. right that's that's always something that people forget right sometimes you need to take a step back and and really think about the whole project right uh and and, and instead of just focusing on the one part that you're working on um, now, another topic that is um, talked about a lot out there today is um, <clears throat> simulation-driven design. So the, the whole concept behind that, obviously, is, you know, hey, design engineer can do some simulation. You don't have, you don't need an expert, an analyst to, to, um, to do the early part or, or some of the, the simulation of your part to make things quicker. What are your thoughts on, on simulation driven design and are you using that in practice? 
Well, um, yes, I mean, there's some of that, but, um, but really, I think, um, I don't know that you'll ever be able to fully replace um, just actually um, that, that coordination, I guess, between um, design and manufacturing mm-hmm. and, and I guess analysis. And I think um, there's only so far you can go with simulation, I guess, is kind of my point. Right. Um, it, and, I, and, you know, I think it's valuable. I think it has its place. And I don't think it's a, a bad thing. Um, but there are, it's not, it's not appropriate for every case, right. I guess is what I would say. Right. So I think sometimes you need to have that, um, almost that real world approach. Uh, and you know, it, you can, in the aircraft world, in the FAA world, um, you can validate something purely by simulation and, or by analysis, um, or you can do it by, you know, physical and, physical testing, whatever. And usually there's a combination of both, right? right? That's what's required. Right. right. And that's almost always the best solution. So that's why I'm, it, it's a good tool yeah. for upfront, but I'm not sure it really applies in every case and it will, it, it's not necessarily going to solve every situation. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think the whole intent of that is just to reduce some of the bottlenecks maybe, right? Because, um, I, I think especially for smaller companies, not every company out there has a design department, a simulation department. Right. Man, you know, I, right. So, so some of the, the smaller co- uh, companies, I, I think that may be a benefit to them, right? Um, just kind of help speed up that process a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. It, it can be beneficial for um, efficiency for, yeah, so it, like I said, it does have its benefits and it is, it does have advantages, but it needs to be looked at from as a whole. Yeah. Wow. I mean, really, really interesting conversation. 30 minutes just flew by. Um, <laughs> but uh, so before we go, uh, are you working on any interesting side projects or maybe hobbies and things that you're doing that uh, that you can share? Oh, uh, in, for my personal life? Yeah. Um, and anything interesting, hobbies or projects that you're working on, a side project? I mean, you know, like I said, I've been learning German for a long time. So that's been, <laughs> uh, that's fun. I figured, uh, well, here I am in Tennessee. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's time I, I picked up an instrument again. Uh, oh, nice. I've done that since I was a kid. So I am now learning the banjo. So, Very nice. Very nice. Um, yeah, it's a little slow for me, you know, it's difficult to move my fingers fast enough <laughs> to make it sound, you know, the way it's supposed to, but, yeah. um, you know, I figure it's, it's kind of fun just to pick it up and, you know, and, um, some of these beautiful, uh, um, I don't know, late afternoon or early evening, maybe go out on the back uh, deck and, um, light a fire and, you know, sit there and watch the sunset and play, just try to. You know, try to make the banjo sound decent. That sounds that so, sounds pretty amazing, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty nice. It's pretty relaxing, actually. Well, Jet, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I really really appreciate our conversation. I think there's there's a lot of good tidbits that you put out there, uh, especially for um, you know young people or students or or um, young engineers who wants to progress and and move forward with the career i mean being an engineer is a is a fantastic career it pays well and you get to be creative so i I think it's it's a it's a great direction but thank you very much for your time and i really appreciate it of course yeah thanks again for having me this is i really enjoyed it as well it was uh it's really good it's really really fun i agree this half hour just screamed right past sounds good i appreciate it jet talk to you soon thanks andy